There we go, I think. Much better. Okay, well, I hope you've had a great lunch, and uh, I hope my presentation doesn't send you to sleep. Because I have a nice lunch, naturally, that's what we want to do. Uh, I also am very uh, integral part of the building design and the building function. And we need to not just always think about structural design. We need to think about the other elements that are incorporated in the structural design. So architects, engineers, structural engineers, all have to think about the other elements that are involved in a high-rise building. And when we talk about a mega high-rise building, which is what some of my colleagues mentioned this morning, we have to even think more deeply. So it is a really important part of the whole element of functionality of the building. Okay, I'm probably going to run a little bit over time because I've got some video clips. I hope they're going to... The elevator system becomes the heart of the building and today's elevators users are becoming more and more centre stage. Passengers have an expectation and that expectation is to feel safe, travel smoothly and enjoy the experience as they are transported throughout a building without delay. And ultimately, that's a building that you have an input into, into the design, into the structural design. So why do we need to change from what we already have? We already have a simple box on the street. That's basically what an elevator is. So let's have a look and have a think about some of those things. Why? Because over the last decade, elevators have become the bottleneck in the evolution of the architecture of buildings and the structural design of buildings. Simply, the mega trend of urbanisation, which my colleagues mentioned this morning, leads to a need for higher buildings. In other words, as more people gravitate to our cities, we need to be able to accommodate them, both from a working aspect and from the functionality of living aspect. They are not wanting to commute out to the suburbia every day and back in. I saw my colleague this morning, uh, Joel Luna, mention about the traffic congestion in the Philippines, in Manila, in the metro city. And he showed a very good slide uh, demonstrating that. So people not only want to work in the city, they want to live in the city. So urban settlements, uh, more than half the world's population, uh, already lives in urban areas and there is expected to be a 2.5 billion increase in urban population by 2050. Can you imagine that? How much our urban population is going to increase by? And do you know that puts a great onus on our young engineers? It puts a huge responsibility on your shoulders to be able to design buildings structurally that can accommodate this flow of population into our cities. Also, besides the number of tall buildings increasing, the average height is increasing. So we've got to rethink outside the box about how we're going to structurally design buildings. How we're going to move the people in the buildings efficiently throughout the buildings. So there's lots to think about other than just the structural steel. So why do we need new technologies? We've got taller buildings, as I've just mentioned, larger floor plates. We need efficient access and egress. We're going to have a higher population density. We have a live and work environment as opposed to just a work and then commute. And we obviously need faster transportation connectivity within that building. So going back and taking a quick look backwards at history, we used to use conventional shafts, single shaft up to 20 floors, a couple of shafts for 40 floors, and then staggered shafts for 60 floors, and beyond we used transfer floors and step up the elevator shafts. I'm going through this very, very quickly because they've given me 20 minutes and I'm going to try and squeeze through. So what happens in many buildings today, the problem is the core size is increasing as the building height. And basically, the elevator core in your nice structural building is swallowing up the interior of the building. So the elevator footprint at the entrance level is increasing with the building height. The lobby becomes overcrowded in peak hours, and we've got insufficient lifting capacity due to cost and space constraints. And the building is becoming more and more inefficient. Less useful space because it's taken up by the elevators, obviously. And if you don't believe me, here are some photographs that I've taken myself 
at 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m. at peak hour in the morning in some of the best buildings in the world. Some of these buildings are in China, some of them are in Hong Kong. If you look at the one just across here, this is 8.15 in the morning, out of a major building in Times Square, one of the highest rent areas in Hong Kong, and these people are not queuing in the street to catch a bus or wait for a taxi, they're queuing in the street to get into the building to catch an elevator to go up to their office. And it is an approximate 20 minute wait. Rain, hail or shine, they have to queue out on the footpath. So we're already facing these issues and they're going to be uh, more complicated as we develop more needs inside the lobby of buildings such as security gates for example. These processes are going to slow everything down. So, getting down to the meat of what we're here to talk about today, what are the new technology solutions that we can bring to the table that you can introduce into structural design, into architectural design, that is going to make a difference in the future? The first one is, and you may be familiar with this, is destination selection control type systems. You'll see them at GLAND, uh, or G Tower, I should say. Uh, and I'm sure there's other buildings in Bangkok that have them. And this is the situation where you have um, uh, a keypad system. So the destination selection control is a far more advanced than just the normal push button system that goes up or down. And it has the ability to group like passengers to like destinations. And based on the passenger's floor selection, the system directs the passenger to the elevator cab that will get them to their destination the quickest. Okay, so if you walk into a building, the passenger enters the destination through the input keypads instead of just pushing the up or down button. The controller up in the lift machine room will then assign uh, the passenger uh, to take it to the quickest destination, to the car, and the elevator is indicated on the keypad screen. So you press the button, it says go to car A, and you'll walk down the lift hallway and line up in front of car A. So there's no need for command buttons in the car, which is quite unusual and disturbing for some people, but that's the way technology is moving. Okay, and as I said, I'm covering this very quickly. The next one is double-decker elevator systems. I don't know how familiar you are with these. But these are basically two cabs in the one shaft joined together like train carriages. So to optimise the core area in tall buildings, what we do is we put in a double car system and therefore we reduce the construction volume and we reduce the amount of space required for elevator shafts. What's the benefit? The customer benefit is more floor space is available and more rental space occurs or saleable space. So it gives a higher efficiency. Some of the things that you may require um, is a split level lobby. In other words, to load the upper car and load the lower car. This also assists in dispersing the pedestrian traffic at peak hours. So you can split the traffic flow into the lower level or the upper level. And a great example of that uh, was again, uh, Joel Luna's presentation this morning from Ayala Properties where he had a multi-level transportation system coming into the building. So he's already dispersing the traffic. And this is part of your structural design, that you can have the train or the metro at one level, you can have the bus system at another, and you can have other forms of transport, such as pedestrian or buses, at a third level. And this all helps split the traffic flow in and out of the building. Okay, so what are the advantages of a double-decker system? The advantages are group arrangement, one on top of the other, course saving. You can have preferred express shuffle, shuffles to save time. You have higher efficiency during the up peak in the morning, 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning. And uh, cars can stop at adjacent floors at the same time. But there's some disadvantages with this system as well. But because it was our next step in technology, that was where we moved to. But the disadvantages are that the two cars join together are less flexible in the shaft because where one car goes, the other car has to go because they're joined together. Two entry levels required, so in the building design, you have to have two entry levels to load the upper and lower car. All cars in the group must be double decker, so you can't have double decker lifts in one shaft and a single deck in the other shaft, or a conventional lift. 
the heavy car masses that need to be moved are not energy efficient except in the peak hour. So for 23 hours of the day, when you're carrying less than full capacity, you're quite inefficient because of the weight of the cars, the size of the machinery, energy needed to drive them. But the big disadvantage, and I don't know whether you've experienced this or not, but the big disadvantage is the passenger experience. When the other car, when you're travelling up in a double-decker lift and the car above stops at the floor and you're in the lower car and the doors don't open, what happens? Fight or flight. That's what happens. Because as soon as the doors don't open, you get scared. And no matter whether you work in that building or whether you just come to it for the first time, you cannot condition yourself to, to completely exonerate it. If I put a CCTV camera in there, watch your eyes, and you're a regular occupant of the building, I would still see it travel across your eyes as soon as those doors don't open. People don't like being trapped in a box. So it hasn't gained a lot of customer acceptance uh, across the market. Also, longer travel times while you're waiting for the upper or lower car to load or unload. So there are some disadvantages with a double-decker system. So where did the industry go from there? The industry went to what we call the twig car elevator system, which also operates with the destination selection control. And this system was developed way back in 1907, but we didn't have the IT technology in those days to efficiently and safely manage the cars in the shaft. So in only in later years, or more recent times, with the investment of large sums of money, we've been able to develop the algorithms that can safely operate these cars and operate them efficiently as well. Okay, so let's see if the video goes. We have video, but no sound. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the best I can do is uh, let you watch the video, try and explain it a little bit as we go along. sound. So uh, I apologise for that, but at least gives you an idea of the concept. You can see the two cars, whoops, you can't even see the cars, I can see them here but you can't see them there. It looks really good. <laughs> okay, the system is basically called Twin Elevator. Concept is two cars in one shaft, but the two cars are not joined together. So taking that premise, you can see <coughs> people are using the heat pads, they've been assigned to like floors, and it's the same as creating, in this case, two tram cars on one track. You can see the upper car on the left, lower car. operating the shaft. By the way, the cars are colour-coded. They've done that for maintenance and safety as well. So every time that we have two cars in the shaft, they are different colours on the base and all the major key components. See the same in the drive systems there. I apologise that we can't give you sound.
keypad in the center there. Somebody goes in, selects, cars assigned to them. Obviously, there's car numbers above the hallway doors in the lift elevator hallway, such as A and B there. seven meters a second and the bottom car at five meters a second and they're traveling on occasions towards each other or away from each other. The speeds are quite high when you can calculate that out. If you've all got your Hewlett Packard calculators here, you can calculate the forces of four or five meters a second and seven meters a second coming towards each other. There's your exercise of the afternoon. Uh, and uh, you can imagine what would happen if they were to touch so there's many safety devices in there as well to keep the car separated. And a typical example would be that if they were approaching each other, then one car would stop at the floor that its destination was programmed to, and the other car would slow down and eventually stop at the floor above, so that there would be no risk of contact. Okay, so let's move on. Um, I've been through a little bit of this already. Two cars are arranged on top of each other. Each elevator has its own traction drive, controller, ropes, counterweights and governor. Both cars can move independently in the shaft. They can approach each other or move away. Um, they can travel in opposite directions. And the call and sign is performed by the destination selection control, which I mentioned before. And I also mentioned that you need a split level lobby. Wherever you have two cars in an elevator shaft, you must, or it's preferable that you have a split level lobby to load the upper car and the lower car and spread the pedestrian traffic flow. Whoops, what's going on? There we go. The one advantage that it really gives people is that in today's buildings, as we saw in one of the earlier presentations, was that more and more building design is going towards mixed use. This is giving developers and owners more flexibility. It's also creating a mix of incomes in the building in terms of uh, building operation. But the most important thing is that it allows these type of systems to be used for different floor heights in the building. You can create floor heights for hotel lobbies, you can create floor heights for restaurants, and you can create lower floor heights for office space areas. Overall, what does it do? And this is the key objective. The key objective is that the elevator footprint is minimized and the number of shafts can be reduced by 18 to 33%. This is incredibly important in today's mega high-rise buildings. A classic example here up on, the, on the right there, uh, sorry, on the left, is a conventional solution of 16 shafts, and with a twin-type system, you can reduce it down to 11 shafts. So you can take five shafts worth of space on every floor of the building out of the equation of need for an elevator. You might say, well, I haven't seen these systems yet. Well, there's over 300 of these systems installed around the world, and the first one was installed way back in 2003. So these systems have been around quite a long time now. They've obviously evolved and developed over the time. They started off at two meters a second, both cars, went now up to seven and five meters a second, which is, you know, quite fast. Okay, so where else do we go with technology? If we don't use a twin elevator system, if we don't use a double-decker solution, or we don't use destination selection and control. One of the concepts that the industry is now moving into is carbon fiber ropes. Carbon fiber ropes allow us to reduce weight. They allow us to do a couple of things. But whilst the recent technology has been introduced, the use of these ropes into the elevator industry still remains largely untestable, with only a small number of low to medium rise installations. Carbon fiber ropes are supposedly designed to reduce rope weight, which they do, and they will increase the travel distance of a single rope. So it allows us to go to greater heights with a single lift of an elevator car. However, they do not significantly reduce the number of shafts required, and that's the key element again. We're trying to minimize the number of shafts in the building. 
Okay, so potential concerns, cost. In low to medium rise buildings, they appear to be uneconomical at this stage. History, there's a limited history. Ropesway needs to be considered, just like it does with steel ropes. Damage, there is a perceived uh, risk that if a carbon fibre rope is damaged, that it will fracture horizontally, not vertically, and it won't fray like a steel rope. It'll just fracture straight across. Durability, unknown at the time tested at this stage, and recycling, we have to be very careful that um, all the fibres going in, all the carbon fibres in are going in are new carbon fibres and not recycled. Okay, so where else are we going to go with technology in the future? Where is the future lead us with elevated technology in structural architectural design? We will very shortly see coming to the market in the industry a game-changing technology. It's going to be game changing for architects and it's going to be challenging for you as engineers because the multi-elevator system will be the world's first rope-free elevator system. And I know some of you understand it. I know that some of you are sitting there, well, how do you get an elevator up a shaft with no rope? We got some answers? Anyone know? Come on. Don't be afraid. All right. We're going to play a video. Again, I don't think we're going to have any sound. Uh, but, uh, hold on, we've got a technician. Stand by everyone, we'll get there. <laughs>
course. There's about too many times. I got too excited about having a sound. Okay, so let's come back a bit. One, two, there we are. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of an idea what multi is, do we understand a little bit about what the technology is that drives it? But more importantly, does it get you thinking about how building design is going to change? It's going to change dramatically. It's unimaginable what we're going to be able to do in the future, structurally, architecturally, aesthetically. So, when we look at the analysis of two-dimensional elevator systems, and like in the present use of one cabin per elevator shaft, using the entire, it's the same as using the entire railway line for one train. So if you miss the train, you have to wait for it to come back again later on. Okay, so operating on the basic premise of a circular system, such as the Paternoster, and some of uh, us older gentlemen will remember what a Paternoster is. It's a circular uh, elevator system that existed in Europe many years ago. Multi consists of various cabins running in a loop up to a speed of five meters a second, enabling passengers to have near constant access uh, to an elevator cabin every 15 to 30 seconds with a transfer stop about every 50 metres. So passengers and people who are moving throughout the building will enjoy reduced wait times and the options of double entries on the ground floor will improve the access as well. Although the ideal the deal building height for multi will be around 300 metres, the system um, won't be constrained in the future by the shape or the height of the building. Okay. What are the benefits? The real benefits in this is that we can move vertically and horizontally in the building in the same shaft and it'll allow the buildings to adopt different heights, different shapes and different purposes. Building design will no longer be limited by the height or vertical alignment of elevator shafts. Opening up possibilities for architects and engineers, as I said, that you have never imagined before. It'll increase the building's usable area by 25%. It'll reduce the elevator footprint by 50% and provide a more comfortable travel movement and passenger experience. It also provides energy savings. A lot of the components in this type of technology are carbon fibre and they will reduce the weight by 50%. Handling capacity will also be increased and you won't have to wait as long as passengers. So this is where technology is going. What's driving it? Let's see if we can get this one going. Uh, hold on a sec. Let's see if we can. Career, 
you are going to see this type of technology replace the current technology of elevators <coughs> that have ropes. And it's going to open up a whole new dimension for you. As I said, it's going to change uh, the way we think about structural design, architectural design. And these are the technologies that are emerging in the world today. And this technology will be in the marketplace by 2019. So that gives you a very brief snapshot view. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity.